Hello, everyone. In the EDAP 688 class, let me just double check here and make sure that I am I am recording. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Uh, this is going to be part one of a two-part uh, because I really want to take the time to show you TPAC. Uh, in a much deeper format than we've done in the past because this then helps you understand this right here, which we talked about a little bit, called uh, Conceptual and Theoretical Frameworks. Let me go over that very quickly. So what is the difference? A theoretical framework is a theory in a form of a model or paradigm that serves as the basis for the study. So right away, when I say TPAC is a theoretical framework, what it's basically doing um, is it's looking at the pieces that make up the framework. In TPAC's case, it is technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. We'll talk all about that in just a second here. And it looks at how they come together and, and their results. In other words, if you did a study a research study using the TPAC model, it would basically help you then be able to make some statements about the question of how is technology integrated into a classroom. A conceptual framework is the researcher's own model. In other words, it is something that a group of people, a university, a group of researchers have come up with that they use um, that is very specific about the problem and it gives direction to understanding the problem within the study. Uh, it may be an adoption of an earlier theory. Usually it is something where someone has looked at it and made their twist and their turns on it. Um, in other classes that you may have had with me, like 587, we talk about the knowledge uh, building principles that's very much a theoretical framework. Um, there is a conceptual framework for the College of Education that was used as a way of guiding what we do in classes. Now that I've said that, and I'm going to put my keychain password in. Sorry about that. That's all we need to know. So it helps give a little bit of frame then to TPAC. TPAC stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. It is based upon earlier work and it is a way to understand the interaction of these three areas. Now, I can't play this video and you can hear it uh, Collaborate Ultra doesn't work like that. But I'm going to strongly, strongly advise you to watch this video. It will give you the whole shooting match. This is also a very long PowerPoint that I'm not going to submit you to or subject you to. I'm going to basically start by looking at this, and then I'm going to hold your hand. We're going to kind of walk through. Um, how we would look at TPAC. Then we're going to look at the uh, particular task we have to do. Now remember, this is just part one. We're going to do TPAC. And then on September the 4th, I believe it is, when we meet again, we'll look at uh, TIM, Technology Integrated Matrix. All right, let's talk about TPAC. TPAC was originally designed around understanding how technology is used in education because there's always been technology in education. You know, we, we went from McGuffey readers uh, and horn books to kids actually having books and paper and pencil. That's technology. One of the biggest, biggest fights we've had in education and the use of technology revolved around blackboards. Uh, by blackboard, I mean that board that you write on with chalk. There was a great deal of argument uh, in the middle 18th, uh, middle 19th century over the use of blackboards because 
as some critics wrote, the teacher would become lazy because all they had to do was write things on the boards and kids just had to copy them down. So this is nothing new about technology and education. What is so different today is older forms of technology always had a very specific purpose. Let's use something even a little more current. That was television in classrooms. I was a television in classrooms child. We always knew that the television's purpose was only one. It was to bring Senorita Robinson into our classroom to teach us Spanish or Miss Gordon to teach us science. You get the idea. Today, technology encompasses so many things. That is why we have the problems we have with technology integration into classroom, because people try to apply the old paradigm of technology does one thing, and we just have to learn that one thing, and then we're good to go. This is why you see so many of the one-to-one -one projects fail, because people go in and they try to apply that paradigm to the fact that kids are given enormous enormous abilities with technology, uh, specifically iPads, computers, Chromebooks, that the one idea of it just doesn't fit because kids can do so many things with it. And because the technology is so mutable and you can change it, it becomes very difficult for teachers to get their heads around how they use it because as soon as they start using it, the kid out there has already come up with another way of using it. Um, and the other part is technologies are never neutral or unbiased. I mean, they, they are, you could do anything you want with them. There is no best way to integrate technology into the curriculum. In other words, there is no one answer. And this was based upon the research that the two gentlemen, uh, Punya and Kohler out of uh, Michigan State University, basically were looking at it through the lens of the work done by a gentleman by the name of Shulman. Now, let me see if I can explain this to you in a way that it becomes fairly straightforward. When we think about the interaction of pedagogy and content, we are looking at work done by a gentleman by the name of Shulman in 1984. What he was looking at was the interplay that teachers had with pedagogy and content. We know that content is the thing you teach, math, science, social studies, language arts, reading, and pedagogy is how you teach. And what Schumann just came up with was two things. The best teachers employ what I call the pedagogical dance, the pedagogical slide, where one pedagogy does not fit for all instances. That pedagogies change based upon context. And so we get a lot of, uh, I'm going to call it pop psychology in education. You know, you've heard the terms guide on the side, not sage on the stage. We get those kinds of things and they, they connote negativity. Uh, what Shulman found was there is a place for all pedagogies. So there is a place for the sage on the stage. There is a place for the guide on the side. And what he said, that is determined by the context. So if I'm starting something new in the class and I have to help kids with the vocabulary, see this a lot in math, you see this a lot in science, heck, you see it a lot in everything we do. There comes a point where we have to take sort of a step outside of the frame and say to kids, okay, when I use the term, 
denominator, this is what I mean. When I use the term numerator, this is what I mean. When I say multiplying the numerator by the denominator, this is what I mean. We all do this. We don't even really think about it. That's your classic lecture pedagogy. And we have to do it sometimes to help kids see and understand vocabulary that is germane to what we're trying to teach. Now, what Schulman goes on to say in his PCK model is that unfortunately what happens is so many times we stop there. Or you'll see teachers try to use a pedagogy that bypasses that first pedagogy of trying to understand what the knowledge is, of vocabulary is, and it turns into a free-for-all. In other words, kids are supposed to find out those things. But moving from the sort of sage on the stage to collaboration, all right, now that you understand the definitions, work together with a partner, think, pair, share, and come up with applications or come up with your own understanding of the definitions of the new terminology. Collaboration, think, pair, share, deep inquiry. Take these vocabulary words that I've given you, come up with ways to demonstrate their application. I don't want a definition that's easy enough to find, but find application and then share with the class. You see what I'm doing here. I am trying to work in the different pedagogies based upon context. I want kids to do demonstrations of understanding, and that might be in a collaborative format. That might be in a deep learning format. I might employ a cognitive um, CAM, cognitive application modeling, uh, where I basically stand and, and say, okay, so this is how I do this. Let's follow along and do it. Context is everything within the PCK model. So the, the knowledge and the nature of inquiry can also differ greatly between fields, and teachers should understand the, neat, neat, the deeper knowledge fundamentals of the disciplines they teach. In other words, you should know your content, forwards and backwards, because if we allow kids to explore content, they're going to come up with different ways. You see this all the time. Now, so there is this understanding of content, and then there's a negotiation process that all good teachers go through, where they look at pedagogy, and they say, pedagogy in this instance is going to be this because this is the introductory part of the content. Pedagogy, when I get into the deeper parts of content, the application of content, the understanding of content, is going to look different. Then we layer on the technology. And when we do that, what happens is, Teachers have a moment of panic because we expect them to be good users of technology. And a lot of them may not be good users of technology. What we might see is technology is used in its basis form, word processing, Google searches, and we never rise to the context um, demonstration with technology. Something that I try to do in every single thing that we do in our classes. I try to rise to the level of synthesis and demonstration with technology to do illustrations of our understanding of whatever the content might be. That is TPAC at its best. Um, Let's go back and look at this five steps to lesson planning with TPAC. So our first step is that we want to choose the learning goals. We know how to do that. You've been taught that since you first became a teacher. You never, 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 one more time, never 
start with technology. You never do that. Otherwise, you're just using technology for technology's sake, and it really doesn't do anything. Also, you have heard my mantra so many times you're sick of hearing it. If it takes you longer than 15 minutes to explain to kids how to use a piece of technology, when I say that, I'm not just talking, this is an iPad, turn it on. I'm talking about something like, well, what we're going to use for our class, a uh, picture chart. Um, how does it work? Can you show me how it works in 15 minutes? If you can't do that, don't use it. Just don't use it. It's not worth the headache and the hassle that you go through trying to figure out um, trying to figure out its purpose. Now, it might be something that you understand perfectly well, but if you can't explain it to a kid in 15 minutes, don't use it. We've settled on a goal. Now we make those pedagogical decisions. Are we creating a way to understand and approach the content that we've already identified. Let's go in and look at this. So you've got to look at the different ways that pedagogy can be used. There's so many pedagogies out there that it's really almost overwhelming to teachers. So let me drop back and let's help you kind of, you don't have to use all eight, obviously. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. But again, think about context. I have to identify vocabulary for you to understand when I use this word. You know, language teachers do that all the time. Um, the word is gato, means cat. And we basically, have to practice using that word in a sentence before we understand that gato in Spanish means cat. Elegant, elegant pedagogical example. When I'm talking about solving for X in a linear equation, well, first of all, I have to have, have kids understand the process, the procedure, and what a parathetical, para, parathetical phrase is. I have to have them understand all of that. Then the technology piece can pop in. In that example I was just using, using a online graphing calculator, Desmos. There you are. There's technology coming in to solve a pedagogical problem. Pick the chart. Comes in after we've had that rich discussion about content. And we've had that Here's what these vocabulary words connected to this content mean. Apply them. Give them back to me in words of your understanding. And now we're going to use something in technology to create an artifact of your understanding. So you're going through this and you're selecting the activity And then you're selecting the assessment. How am I going to know what you did this? Again, let's use the pick the chart example. So in the pick the chart example, the kid goes in and he creates an infographic that basically demonstrates through the use of words, video, pictures, their understanding of whatever the content is that we have been talking about. Once you understand it that way, it really does become fairly straightforward as to what it is that we're doing. I'm going to run this by you. I promise not to take too long with it, but I just want to reemphasize everything I've just said to you about TPAC. So this is the framework. As you can see, it's an intersection of content, pedagogy, and technology. Let's review. 
always, 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 you start with content. Always, 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 there is a basic understanding of content that you draw upon and then you can go deeper into because that allows you then to do more things with pedagogy. And then last is technology. Here we have the wicked problem. And I explained that to you by saying that the problem with technology and education today is it slips around. Uh, the wicked problem is an acute phrase. It's actually something that C. West Churchman, a sociologist, came up with uh, again in the 1980s. And as you can see, he says very clearly here, the requirements are incomplete, contradictory, and changing. No two wicked problems are the same. Solutions are difficult to realize. Solutions are not right or wrong. Solutions do not have stopping rules. Boy, that says it all about technology and schools. There's our guy, Lee Shulman. I was wrong, 1987, not 84. His book, Those Who Understand Knowledge, Growth, and Teaching, is where he basically outlines the idea of the interplay between content pedagogy and next knowledge. And what they're getting at here is if you don't know your content, you got no you can't change up pedagogy effectively. If you don't know your content, you really don't have any business touching a piece of technology. Same thing goes for in pedagogies. You have to know multiple kinds of pedagogies. Now, what some teachers do is they will try a pedagogy, mainly because their PLC has information about how to use it with content. Um, they've seen other teachers use it. And it may or may not work. If it works, then it becomes part of their toolkit. What Shulman keeps harping on is the idea that we have to realize that pedagogies are always, always dependent upon context. What are we trying to do here? Here's a silly little cartoon that says, I asked my catering students to take everything with a grain of salt, and I asked my plasterers to lay it down with a trowel. Context is everything. Here's a statement from Shulman's book. If preconceptions are misconceptions, which they so often are, Teachers need knowledge of strategies most likely to be fruitful in reorganizing the understanding of learner because those learners are unlikely to appear before them as blank slates. Work by Brighter and Scardamalia maintains that knowledge are artifacts. They are real that we carry around in our heads. And because they're real to us, we're very reluctant to let them go. So when we have a misconception knowledge that is a misconception it's really really hard for us to let it go so the pedagogical ability that we have as teachers give kids a chance to see those understandings in a different light that might help them either further their understanding or recognize that their understanding might be wrong um, if we could get kids to enunciate that I thought I understood it this way but now I see it that it really is like this those are those wonderful aha moments that all teachers live for to have kids enunciate very clearly their understanding of what the content is I'm jumping through here because you don't need all this stuff Tedic uh, teaching with Tedic technology is a wicked problem and it requires creative solutions so they use a acronym called new novel effective and whole but novelty must be joined to purpose and when we look at effectiveness 
it must lead to outcomes. And then the whole thing, the gestalt of the whole thing, holds up. So when you say to a student, we're going to be learning about this, and we're going to play around with it. We're going to play around in small group, in collaborative groups. We're going to play around in it with you using tools. Could be technology, could be paper, pencil, could be papers and scissors. We're going to play around with it so that you can have a chance to experience it from multiple, multiple perspectives to build that overall understanding. But everything should be pulled together. Technology in the presentation that was done by uh, Punya and Kohler, they used a, a phrase called tweaking the knobs. What they meant by that is the knobs are those affordances, and affordance is something you use to do something. The brake on your car is an affordance to have the car stop. Affordances that teacher create through playful interaction with their curriculum. If we don't give teachers an opportunity to play with technology and to build expertise in it, or at the very least, an understanding of it, then we can't expect them to incorporate that into their curriculum. Because to that point, they don't understand how the whole thing fits. Now, let me pop through these examples because we don't need to dwell on them, but let me get to here. But let me sh walk you through what they see as the flow for technology adoption by teachers into their teaching. Uh, this has been created, by the way, by a lady by the name of Maggie Neese. Uh, she's from the University of Oregon. She is a math uh, professor. Well, math education professor, I should say. So the first step is Teachers are able to use technology, understand how it could be used for subject matter, but do not integrate it. Well, actually, the first step is teachers understand their content, and teachers understand how their content can be understood by students through multiple applications of different, differing pedagogies. That's your first step. Technology is teachers attend a PD. They're shown how to use a tool. Right now, the perfect example of that is Google Classroom. You probably have already had somebody either tell you about Google Classroom, show you about it, had they gone any deeper than showing you how to make an assignment and how to collect grades. You see? So at this level, there is a content purpose, there is a pedagogical purpose, but now the technology is it building upon those two things to drive its use any further than just as a grade book? And what happens with that is teachers then will form either a favorable or unfavorable attitude toward using technology. You know, and, and there are so many examples of this that I could sit here for the rest of the day and give them to you. When we first brought in Infinite Campus, we had we had been using up to that time the classic Joe's here, put a check, Joe's not here, put a minus. And then there was a person that showed up at your door from the office who basically picked up the attendance sheets for the day. Or you sent it down to the office with the kid. Now you put that in through your computer. And that scenario. You could have all the unfavorable attitudes you want, but you have to do it. But when it comes to the teaching, you can form an unfavorable attitude. And if someone isn't standing there with a stick, you are not going to use it. Because you don't see how it fits in those first two interactions of content pedagogy. 
But if you do accept it, then the next step is it's usually a one-trick pony. You learn how to use Google Classroom. You set up a Google Classroom. You make it your Google Classroom. You change the theme. You go in and you put in information in the About tab and you explain the classroom. Maybe you put a picture of yourself in there. Maybe you put in the uh, teacher email in there so kids can reach out to you with questions. You know, you, you take that basic shell and you start making it your own. Now, further enhancing that shell, you go down to that little plus in the lower right, and you click on it, and you click on assignment. Now you start building assignments within the Google Classroom that either mirror or supplement what you've been doing in class. Now within the assignment, pedagogy can change, can't it? Because within the assignment, you might have a link in there that sends kids off to something technological, like PictoChart. And then in the assignment, you say, go to PictoChart, create an infographic, explain your understanding of what we're doing. And then you ask kids to take the URL, the link, of that creation and you put it into the assignment in the uh, comment part or you have them make a post. So in that particular one is where you see teachers implement tech in their classroom leading them to a choice to adapt it or to adopt it for their teaching use. Because what you're now doing is because your understanding of the content is so deep that when you give something like an infographic as, an, as a, a tool, and by the way, you could do this with Glogster, you could do this with oh, just a lot of tools, actually. You could do it with slides with inside of Google, in other words, making a little presentation. There's all kinds of ways. But what you're doing here is, is you're adopting it to your use based upon your understanding of content. So when a kid gives you an infographic, because your content knowledge is so deep and so wide, you can look at that infographic and you can see readily, so this is what the kid is trying to say, and then you can look at it and go, yeah, they understand what we talked about because the coherent pieces are here, here, here. And finally, teachers make revisions in their curriculum to make room for the technology. And they're able then to enunciate and evaluate how that technology works for them. Something which you know that I have said since the first class you ever took with me is also very important. All technologies don't work for you. It's this process you go through of trying things out, figuring out what works effectively. Hello, back to novel effective at home. And does it then fit in the gestalt? In other words, if I use the technology, is it getting at what I initially started out to do? And what you initially started out to do always goes back to always goes back to content, and the content is always based upon the standards. Pretty simple. Pretty hard. Using technology is very different from then using it for instructional purposes. You know, I go into classes of 201 students here at the university. Uh, 201 people are like in their sophomore year. Um, and I go in and I get them something to do. And 
I say now, go in and use uh, Google Slides to create a presentation of your understanding. I don't even think twice that they may or may not know how to use a presentation tool. You know, there's, there is a conceit that we now have that most everybody understands what a presentation is and how to make it. Now, that conceit sometimes works. In other words, yeah, everybody goes in and makes the presentation. And what's funny is, is when you go and look at your results, because the PowerPoint kings and queens just float up to the top right away. And you see that with all these multicolored backgrounds and the uh, crayon background and the spiral notebook nap background. Uh, and if it's PowerPoint, things are flying in and going everywhere. And that's another whole, you know, teachable moment about what makes good a good presentation. But we always, always, always have to realize that when we use technology for our personal purposes and then we turn around and use it with kids, our results from them are going to be across the spectrum of how it's going to turn out, just like using the infographics. I'll show you how to use it, but I don't expect yours to look like mine. I expect yours to look very differently from the one that I show you. Hang on a sec. Sorry about that. That was my TARP 3 schedule calling in. We're in no hurry. So designing or redesigning your content, your instruction, excuse me, always, always must require a knowledge about content pedagogy and technology overlapping to inform your choices for curriculum and instruction. Always remember to think about how the technology might impact the pedagogy that you want to use in your classroom. If you send kids off to a website to do a creation of understanding, well, that's going to be a heck of a lot different pedagogy than talking at them for two classrooms and then giving them a quiz. That's going to require you to have a much stronger management system in place. And it's going to require you to rethink, how do I set all this up? All right, I'm going to stop there. I think I've beaten it to death. And as I said, if you go in and watch this video, this TPAC Simply Explain, it will take everything I've just done over the last 45 minutes. I think it's like three minutes long. No, I'm wrong. It's five minutes. It will take you through and do a marvelous job of explaining TPAC to you. Now, eventually, what we're going to do so let me take you back a page and let's look at the assignment here. And right here where it says lecture for module one, this little lecture that I'm giving right now will be in here tomorrow. Okay. So I'll send you a link through the announcements that says here's where the lecture is. But I also will have the full video sitting right here. What we're going to be doing is you're going to build an infographic using Pictochart. And here it is. And you're going to log in as me. And that will be as sbswan02 at louisville.edu. Password will be ULIT241. Don't worry, we'll do this again because we're really not ready to do this yet. And you're going to build an infographic. Infographics are, I think, one of the best ways that we can have kids, today's kids, explain to us their understandings. And as I said, 
creating using an infographic can be done in so many ways. In fact, one of the things I like about this product is, first of all, it gives us all these templates that we can play with. And the fact that you're in my account means you have access to all of the frameworks or templates. And once you pick them, if you want to use, say, this one, here's the other thing I want you to realize is over here where we look at uploads, there are literally hundreds now of germane uploads that are very specific to what we've been sitting here talking about, TPAC, et cetera, et cetera. So you can look there for your graphics. Here are our graphics right here. You can use their graphics. You can do the uploads. Uh, you can do searches. Put your search here. And then, of course, your text boxes. If you use a template, the text boxes have already been defined. You just go in, wipe out the text, put your text in. Again, if you are a comfortable uh, PowerPoint user or Google Slides user, you won't have any trouble. But we're not ready to do that yet because when we get back together again on the 4th, not the 4th, the 11th of September, I will uh, at that time take you through Tim and we will look at what Tim means. Tim is very much a conceptual framework. Whereas TPAC is a theoretical framework, and TPAC looks at teachers' uses of technology. Tim looks at kids' uses of technology. In other words, how, how are kids using technology in the classroom, and how successful are they with using it? We will then use a video lesson from this wiki. And we will go to the page called Technology in Classroom Videos. We will find a video in here. And we will look at it through the lens of Tim and TPAC. In our Blackboard, uh, excuse me, live text space, what we'll be looking at is when you go in, you'll notice that there's only two assignments in our class. The first assignment encompasses the three modules that we're doing. So in this first module, what we're going to do is we're going to go in, we're going to put in the link to our video. And then we're going to evaluate it using this is TPAC, Evaluation Observation Instrument. And then here's the TIM. And the way you'll do it is all you have to do is go in, hit the edit, and if you think that in the, the uh, TPAC one, that matching technology to curriculum, and if you think it's a four, technology used in the lessons are strongly aligned with one or more curricular goals, you're going to highlight it, and you're going to bold it. Go down through each one of these indicators, mark it, and then go down here and do the same thing with the TIM. As I said, I'll explain TIM to you the next time we get together. That's short, and that's to the point, but I also think you have a fairly decent understanding, at least a beginning understanding, of TPAC. Um, I don't find TPAC, some people make TPAC sound like it's really, really difficult to understand. I don't find it difficult to understand at all. When I watch a class, when I was doing K-TIPS, the thing that I always would look for is, where does the technology come in? 
Is it a tool that the teacher mentions at the beginning of instruction? Today we'll be using uh, our Desmos calculators. The teacher teaches, different pedagogies occur, and then the technology comes in as a way of checking for understanding. Sometimes you don't see it necessarily as a checking for understanding. It can be used as a tool for research, or it can be used as a tool to build other things. So, TPAC is very straightforward. It is a tool to use to see if the teacher is applying content knowledge, doing the pedagogical slide, and technology is helping with both of those. That's it. Make sure you watch the video, please. It really does a very good job of driving all this home. And the next time I see you, we'll be looking at our little friend here. And we'll be talking about Tim, the technology integration matrix. As always, if you have questions, concerns, I can be reached very quickly. 502-457-2937. If you have any questions or concerns, Steve, can I go ahead and work ahead? Of course you can. That's the beauty of this class. And I hope you just realized when he said what he said, how many modules do we have in this class? One, two, three, and the fourth one really is just a listing of tools for you to use. So as you can see, not going to take us long to get through this. So that's why I want you to take your time and really understand these different technologically related aspects of curricular development. All righty, as always, 502-457-2937. I will see you not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, the following Wednesday, no, I'm just dropping everything. The following Wednesday, we will pick this up again. We will pick this up again and we will continue on. So we won't meet on Wednesday the first. I'm not the first, excuse me. We will meet on Wednesday the 12th. Got that? Alrighty, I will see you on Wednesday, September 12th. We're already in deep into the swing of school. Thank you.